judgment of God written, the Acts of the Apostles, the first chapter, the first 14 verses. Acts 1, 1 through 14. I shall be making my way across the Atlantic tomorrow with good memories of the Christian witness in London and particularly of the people of God here at Westminster Chapel. It's been nice to have had the opportunity to minister again, and we shall have you in our prayers. Anyone who travels much today gains two irresistible impressions. One is the fascinating grip of materialism on, on modern life. Wherever one goes, be it the United States or Western Europe or Eastern Europe or South America in the big cities or the big cities of Asia or the big cities of Africa. The soul of modern man is being sucked dry by material concerns. We are like deflated balloons that refuse to stay aloft, like kites that were made to soar in the skies, but are tangled in the trappings and mired in the muck of earthly things. The other night, a few of us were gathered in the home of some generous members of this church, and we were talking about the secular materialistic mode. And we agreed that the problem is not necessarily with affluence or with possessions. It is rather with our sense of dependence on things more than on God, our lack of sense of stewardship. I know a Christian worth somewhere between a half million dollars and a million dollars, who, because of fear of not having enough in these uncertain times, finds it harder to give a hundred dollars for some evangelical cause for which she has been praying than almost anything that she has to do. We are in the clutch of our material possession. They wring our spirits dry. And the world, which has this materialistic spirit, impinges even upon the life of the churches in this regard. The world communicates her ailments to the churches, her afflictions. Alongside this, this secular, materialistic spirit that hugs at our very being, there is a second factor. That is the sense of disenchantment, of disillusionment with material things on the part of those who have them. People know that an abundance of things is not the same as the abundant life. And there is a restless probing of the transcendent world, the invisible world, the spiritual world, 
and it takes many, many forms. There is the interest in Oriental religions. People know something about the moral claim that Christianity makes. And they can escape from this, perhaps, and find some alternative that speaks of the invisible world. The interest in the occult, in transcendental meditation, in Zen, which have largely become passing fads already on the American scene. The interest even in spiritualism and in the demonic. And also a new interest on the part of some in what makes Christianity go. Why is it that this religion of 2,000 years and which claims behind it, the religion of the Hebrews, which extends all the way back to the beginnings of mankind, is here? That hundreds of people come out, for example, the Westminster Chapel, even on a Sunday night. And people come in from the cold, wondering what makes the churches click. And this curiosity, there may be a lot of curiosity and confusion about miracles and tongues and healings and revelation. The people come out from the, the spirit come in from the spiritual cold. What is there that's inside? I was talking a year ago with a professor at one of the New York universities. And he was sharing his own story of how he was brought up, actually, in, uh, in a, a supposedly Christian home, at least formally so. His, his father was a, a clergyman and uh, knew only a formal Protestant uh, commitment. The realities were not there. As a teenager, this lad let it all go, and he married. And his wife, too, was a professional woman, he teaching at one of the large New York universities, and he said, one night we were just talking and we decided that our lives were empty. And the following Sunday, we we went to church just to see what there was, if it was anything like it used to be. And he said, I found Christ, and then my wife found Christ. People just come in from the cold like that, wondering what there is. And if the church is going to count for much, Amid this confusion and this uncertainty and this longing, she will need the truth and the joy and all these spiritual realities that the early Christians had in an environment that was almost totally contrary and largely hostile. She will need the lost radiance that seems to have gone from much of contemporary Christianity. The evangelical churches have indeed the Easter glow. But what the early Christians seem to have had was not simply the Easter glow, but what I might call the post-Easter afterglow the post-Easter afterglow, an ongoing radiance that was nurtured by a reality beyond Easter morning. Tonight I'd like to, to visit them with you and learn something about the ground of that radiance 
because from much of modern Christianity, the luster is gone. It seems to have grown dull and dim. And I want you to see tonight something of the reality of the crowned Christ, as he was known in the experience of the early community. They knew, those early Christians, that the church is not primarily a building located at one intersection in the city to which people commuted periodically in order to hear someone preach a sermon. Now, we can be glad that they pushed the walls out of houses and that homes could no longer contain them. But one thing they knew, that the Church of Jesus Christ is primarily a fellowship of persons, a company of twice-born men and women. A people once dead in their sins, with a consciousness that their sins had been forgiven, and forgiven on the ground of the perfect life and substitutionary death of the crucified Jesus who demonstrated himself to be alive and who was indeed alive in their midst. I am he that liveth and was dead. The church knew and recognized that voice. Those Christians knew that the church was called into existence by the crucified and risen Christ. They knew him as risen. Stunned by his, stunned by his crucifixion. Stunned by his crucifixion. They were shocked alive. They were stabbed awake by his resurrection from the dead. He who said, It is finished, said, Handle me and see that it is I myself. And he who gave up the Spirit on Golgotha breathed the Holy Spirit upon them. They knew him as risen. And they knew that the risen Jesus was calling his church into being. And the most exciting aspect of their gathering together as we gather at night was not simply that they would see each other as people who had somehow been wrested out of the world and brought into the realities of grace by the Spirit of God, dramatic as that was, as now one and another who belonged to the, to the, to the evil one and was out there in the world had been translated into the kingdom of light and found Jesus Christ real. Dramatic as that was, the more important thing for them was that the risen Jesus was present in their midst as they met together. Invisible, yet personally present. All oh, you who are here without Christ tonight, the Master is here, and he calleth for you. And you who are Christians, and for whom church-going may have become something merely routine, I am in the midst of them, said Jesus, where even two or three are gathered together. The early church knew Jesus as risen and alive. It is as if someone intimately known to you had been taken, dead and buried. You should say, I saw him, I know, I know him, 
He is back from the dead. He is alive. The early church knew that the risen Christ is calling his church into bear. How is it with you? What is at the center of the origin and the continuance of the church is nothing less than one who was crucified and who came back from the dead and showed himself alive and who demonstrates his ongoing power in the creation, the origin, the addition to the church. They knew him not only as risen, they knew him as ascendant. As ascendant. Once it seemed that the Father had spurned him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Once it seemed as if heaven's door were closed to him. But then he was taken up, we read. He was received into glory. The Father was waiting for him. There was a welcome for him. He had come to die in the sinner's place. Once atonement was made, heaven was open, and his ascension was a pledge to the early Christians of their own future glory. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says. Whither the forerunner is for us entered. Hear it again. Whither the forerunner is for us entered. They knew the ascended Christ. His ascension was a pledge of their and is a pledge of our rapture. As the thrill of it, as the joy of it, as the drama of it, broken in your own Christian experience as it did for those early followers of Jesus Christ. Has it impinge upon your life as it did upon theirs? Because the ascension of Jesus changed their whole praise. For it was now praise to the ascended Lord. It changed their whole witness. It changed their whole preaching. It changed their whole life and mission. What does it do for you? Indeed, they knew him not only as risen, not only as ascended, they knew him as exalted, exalted. As, the, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he sat down at the Father's right hand. Listen to these words from Ephesians 1, beginning at the 19th verse, where Paul writes of the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe, according to the working of his great might, which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him to sit at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who filleth all in all. The head of the church was seated at the Father's right hand, the place of honor, the place of privilege. They knew not only Jesus of the Christmas season, Jesus of the Bethlehem manger. They knew Christ on the throne. 
They knew not only the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount with his magnificent teacher, they knew Christ on the throne. They not knew not only the Jesus of Gethsemane, the anguish of the garden, they knew Christ on the throne. They knew not only the Jesus of Golgotha, where he died for us, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. They knew Christ on the throne. They knew not only Jesus of Easter morning. He is risen. But they knew Christ on the throne. They knew not only the Jesus of the Emmaus walk. They knew Christ on the throne. They knew not only the Jesus of Ascension morning. They knew Christ on the throne. They knew the crown Christ. They knew that the crown Christ is calling his church into being. And that this universe is not ultimately in the grip of totalitarian tyrants like the ruler of the Roman Empire, not ultimately in the grip of impersonal fate or of demonic forces or of Satan. They said, we see not yet all things under him, but we see Jesus. Jesus in his triumph over Satan. Jesus in his triumph over sickness. Jesus in his triumph over sin. Jesus in his triumph over death. We see Jesus. And they knew that he added to the church daily such as should be saved. He added. And they knew that he gave some. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, the evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He gave. And this conviction burned in their hearts like a ball of fire. They knew that the crown Christ above creates his church below. Do we have that sense? What it means that the church is here and the living organism. They knew not only this, that the crown Christ above creates his church below. They knew that the crown Christ above commissions his church below. The church owes not only her being, she owes her task in the work, her vocation to the exalted Jesus. There are thousands of organizations, even in this one great city, with a good and commendable humanitarian purpose. But the church is the one movement in all of history whose vocation was defined for her by the crucified and risen Jesus. Once Jesus said, go not into the way of the Gentiles. Thank God he reversed that command. Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Even after 40 days of his resurrection ministry, the disciples were not quite sure of the direction of the immediate future. They said, Lord, will you at this time restore again 
the kingdom of Israel. And he said, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father hath put in his own control. But you shall be witnesses unto me, the Holy Spirit coming upon you. You shall witness in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He had a mission for them and for us. For this purpose, the church was called into being. What differentiates the church from all the moral and philosophical movements of history is that the task of the church is a task that was enunciated by resurrection lips. Go ye! Go ye into all the world. Westcott, in his great commentary on John's Gospel, says something about Jesus incorporating the believers into the redemption covenant of the Godhead. That sounds rather difficult to get hold of, and I want to unpack it for you. He speaks of the church being incorporated into the resurre- into the redemption covenant of the Godhead. What Jesus said, as the Father hath sent me into the world, even so send I you. What a tragedy if he had not gone. What a tragedy if we did not go and there was nothing that troubled the early Christian community more than the possibility that it might be disobedient in its mission. It resisted rulers, the fiercest, op- fiercest opposition. We ought to obey God rather than man. Nothing so troubled them as the possibility that they might fail in their mission, that they might be disobedient to the orders that they had from the crucified and risen and reigning king. They knew that the crown Christ above commissioned his church below. Now they knew one other thing. They knew not only that the crown Christ above creates his church below, and that the crown Christ above commissions his church below, but they knew also that the crown Christ above confirms his church below. He confirms his church below. He was active in the midst of the life of the church. They knew that they had been lifted to new levels of personal relationships through Jesus, to new levels of personal power through Jesus, and to new levels of personal virtue through Jesus. They knew that the crown Christ above confirms his church below. First, he had lifted them to a new level of personal relationships. They knew indeed that though it would not be until the end time that they would again see him face to face, Nonetheless, they were bound to him somehow, heart to heart. What they did not know was that he would come and indwell them by the Spirit. 
And Paul could exult in the fulfillment of Jesus' great promise. If any man love me, my Father and I will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Their lives were to be the permanent temple of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, in and through the Spirit, would make his home in that. Long before we were to be gathered into the eternal mansion, I go to prepare a place for you. He came to make a dwelling place in the hearts of his own people the people of God, the twice-born, the company of believers who realized, who recognized him as the crucified and living head of the church. And while they would have been disturbed if they lived in our time over the population explosion and that there are the prospect of so many humans crowding the earth, what would have troubled them much more is the fact that the multitude of humans who are here seem resigned to what, from the standpoint of the new life in Christ that they had found, could only seem like a living death. Christ in you, the hope of glory, writes Paul, the glorious hope. They were a transformed people who had found the significance of what it was to be not merely half human, fallen from the great destiny for which God had created man, made in his image for fellowship with God and in the service of God, imaging Jesus. For them the great tragedy would have seen the world somehow insistently deprived itself of the privileges, the glorious realities that were possible in the personal relationships that had been offered through the grace of Jesus Christ. They knew that they had been lifted to a new dimension of personal relationships. They knew too that they had been lifted to a new dimension of personal power. They would not have been intimidated by the fact that the scientific technological world had developed nuclear power with all its destructive potential. They knew the God who had created the universe. Paul opens his epistle to the Romans, the Christians at the heart of that super empire, that world empire of his day, the symbol of power. He opens his epistle with a reverence to the eternal power of the Creator manifest every day since the creation in the universe that he has made. power of the Creator. They knew not only a creative power, they knew the recreative power of the God. They knew a power that could not simply destroy, but a power that could give light, that could recreate, that could take humanity and its sins and remake it in the image of God with a destiny, a holy destiny in eternity. They would not have been inhibited in a power-minded age. They would not have felt at bay by the sort of society in which we live, as if the church has only puny power to speak about in contrast with the technological environment in which it lives. They knew power, the God of all power. And Paul, in writing the Romans, could say that we who are Christians are super conquerors. The Romans knew what conquerors were. 
but neither death nor life, nor principalities nor powers can separate us from the love of God shown in Jesus Christ. They knew that they had been lifted to a new dimension of power. How about you and your Christian commitment to him in this city, in this time? They knew not only that they had been lifted to a new dimension of personal relationships and to a new dimension of power, but they knew that they had been lifted to a new dimension of virtue. They knew the Holy Spirit. And they knew the fruit of the Spirit. We hear a lot about the gifts of the Spirit today. There's so much controversy about this. And remember, gifts are gifts. And nobody can determine what gifts another person ought to have or must have but God. But the fruit of the Spirit is for all Christians. Every last one of us, they knew that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, on and on. One reads the book of Acts. After the story of the ascension, In the beginning of the Christian witness in Samaria and finally unto the uttermost parts. It ends up at Rome. Time and again, it is clear that all their moral power, those early Christians, was found in and through the work of the Holy Spirit in them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and with power. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and with boldness. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and with wisdom. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and with peace. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and with joy. They knew that they had been lifted. Sinners defeated Once they were, they knew that they had been lifted to a new dimension of power. They knew that the crown Christ above creates his church below. That the crown Christ above commissions his church below. And that the crown Christ above confirms his church below. And if we find this for ourselves, can London ever be the same? If we find this for ourselves, by the grace of God, if we know what it is, to be Christian. In a day when materialistic affluence so much impinges upon us, and when there is so much restlessness and disenchantment with things, the longing for some relationship to the invisible world, can we help this generation to understand what the durable spiritual realities really are. Oh God, put your hand upon us. Put your hand upon us, oh God. Your holy omnipotent hand. And stir in us a longing to be what you would have us be that we may be in such a needy time, the people of God, as you would shape us and commission us and confirm us. 
For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now the hymn is number 750. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Number 750. Now may a dying Savior's love and a risen Savior's power and an ascended Savior's prayer and a coming Savior's glory be the comfort and joy of all who have been reconciled to God by the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. Amen.